they levitate. So if you put a magnet on top of a superconductor, it levitates. And this is quantum emergence in action. So I'm going to talk about um, something I term quantum emergence. So what is emergence? It's also something you might have heard in other areas, not just uh, physics. It essentially relates to collective ensembles of objects collectively self-assembling to form something very, very different from the individual constituents. Um, and you can think about um, people in crowds, so the collective behaves very differently from each individual member. You can think about something like consciousness. It would be very far-fetched to think of consciousness in terms of individual neurons, in cutting up the brain and saying, okay, what are the individual elements that make it up, and somehow I'm going to add them together and arrive at the functioning of the brain and consciousness. It's almost as absurd, it is as absurd, to think about materials that are all around us that are made up of trillion trillions of electrons and imagine that the collective self-organized processes that emerge from them, which are as complex and as exotic as consciousness, to be in some way derivable from a reduced equation of individual electrons. So instead, um, how I think of it is, for instance, this is um, a painting from M.C. Escher. So at one end, you can think about this as individual electrons, where you have the birds, which are not really interacting with each other. As you increase the extent of interaction between the electrons, by the end, it ends up looking like buildings. So at this point, it has no connection with what it started out with. You can't start with whatever this new collective self-organized entity that is formed with and say, I'm going to be able to explain it in terms of what we started with. Uh, my initial starting point is this reductionist approach is not something that works for emergent systems. Um, and this is just an example of one of the very exotic forms of emergent phenomena, which is superconductivity. So this is a superconducting material, which I'll tell you about in a bit. Uh, sorry, these, uh, the, the puck is the superconducting material. And this is a string of magnets. So essentially what you see happening here, you can see this is levitation. So superconducting materials have a couple of really interesting properties. Firstly, they conduct electricity perfectly without any loss. And this is a dramatic quantum property, and I'll show you an example in a bit. And the second is that they levitate. So if you put a magnet on top of a superconductor, it levitates. And this is quantum emergence in action. If you took a single electron or a few electrons, you would not get superconductivity it would not be predicted from the model. The way superconductivity was discovered is that first people took materials, um, cooled them down to very, very low temperatures, discovered that they lost all resistance to the flow of electricity, that there was this amazing uh, property of levitation. So it was an experimental discovery. And then they worked backward and said, okay, how can we form a model that now explains this? Um, so, emergent phenomena are as exotic as this, and uh, this is again an example of the applications of superconductivity. So, um, an MRI machine, where you put your head into and have an MRI done, that's a superconducting magnet. So, these aren't just exotic phenomena in a laboratory, they're applied. And the giant ring, so you might ha be familiar with the CERN experiment. So, there's a large ring that's... Um, I believe 18 miles uh, in circumference, that's a giant superconducting magnet. So every electron, any point in this is perfectly correlated with every other electron. This is a collective self-organized effect. These electrons don't bump into each other like in regular metals. They all form a giant quantum wave, which has the property of what you saw there, electricity would flow perfectly through such a large loop. In this case, it's a superconducting magnet which channels the electrons, which accelerates them as they go through. So this is just one example of an emergent phenomena. So what I try to do is to discover new emergent quantum phenomena. And so starting from the claim that a reductionist approach is not the way to start, 
I wouldn't start of it imagining it as Lego blocks. I think often uh, physicists like to think of models in which we say, okay, we understand how one thing behaves, let's break it down to the most fundamental particle, like these little Lego pieces, and from there we can build whatever we want, so we can dial up a phenomena. So start with individual fundamental particles, and we can build material quantum matter. That isn't really how it works, and this is because, as I told you, we have trillion, trillion electrons. It's much more like thinking of, this is just um, uh, a comparison for fun, this is a rat's brain with 100 billion neurons, this is a universe with 100 billion galaxies. This is just to give you an idea, this is not even trillion, trillion. This is an order of magnitude less. That's the level of complexity we're dealing with. So we deal with them much more like entangled complex systems, not like Lego blocks. So of course the question is, this is all well and good, but if I wanted to discover a new quantum phase of matter, how would I do that given this l uh, level of complexity? And this is where what I call quantum alchemy comes into play. And essentially what I mean by quantum alchemy is one quantum phase of matter transforming into another quantum phase of matter. So rather than start with Lego blocks, build them up and say, uh, well, hope I get a new quantum phase, I start with an existing phase of matter that's quite ordinary or mundane. So just to um, um, give you a, a concept of what phases are, it's a little bit like water, ice, and steam, right? They're made up of the same constituent um, atoms, but at different temperatures, they transform. So water boils, becomes steam, water melts, become I becomes ice. Quantum phases are a little bit like that, except they're uh, entangled in in much more profound ways and they're at low temperatures, but it's a similar idea of one phase transforming into the other. So what I look to do is start with a more conventional phase of matter, say start with a magnet, something that's ubiquitous. And through a process that I'll describe at the moment, experiment on it and look to transform its properties into another quantum phase with exotic, unconventional, unknown, unimagined properties. And so the starting point is, this is, this is a, a cartoon or a schematic, so I start with one phase of matter here, which is known, and go through this point of discontinuity. And this is where, so for example, water boiling into steam, there's a point of discontinuity, which is the boiling point, where there's maximal chaos. There's maximally large fluctuations, the entire system is turbulent, and then it swaps into the other phase. And that region of maximal chaos is where I look to experimentally study. And in the quantum world, not just is there maximal chaos and turbulence, but new phases of matter emerge there. So experimentally, this is the region I try to access, this region of uh, instability, of discontinuity, or quantum phase transition. And empirically and phenomenologically, what uh, we found is that this is like a portal to a new region of quantum phase space. So this is where if you experimentally approach, it doesn't just swap into the other phase, it doesn't become a combination of these, an entirely new phase emerges. It's like opening a portal to a new universe. So the experimental tools I use, um, so th this is what I actually do in the laboratory, I go to very cold temperatures, so um, down to lower than minus 270 degrees Celsius, so a few millikelvin, so very close to absolute zero, where quantum effects are maximal. I work with diamonds, so I should have had a scale on there. So this tip, so this is a, um, a coin, so this tip is about 100 microns, so um, not too much bigger than a human hair. So this is like a tip of a stiletto heel, exerts pressure. So the tip of a diamond, you exert much more pressure almost as much pressure at the Earth's core, so that's where you can transform materials. Um, and the third experimental tool I use is very high magnets. So the, this is a very big magnet, um, which is 45 tesla strong. That's about 10,000 times as strong as a magnet on your fridge. So this is a very, very high magnetic field. This is me and my research group. We travel to Florida to use these high field uh, magnets. So essentially, I take a material that is well-known, that it, it's in a phase that we understand, 
and I apply low temperatures, high pressures, and high magnetic fields to take it to that point of transition instability and look to see how its properties transform, it's almost like entering a new materials universe. So the universe we're in, we can't go and change its conditions and say, I'll just turn up the temperature a little bit, I'll change the atmosphere, just as well life wouldn't exist if we did that. But I can take a crystal of a material with, these, with this whole universe of electrons in it, change the conditions, and it's like changing the universe and creating a new phase. So this is the only data slide I'm going to show. Uh, this is, we start with a magnet. So uh, these were experiments we did when we created a superconductor. So we started with a magnet. Um, its transition temperature is minus 150. Um, that's not important. So you apply pressure to it. So we applied pressure. It became less and less good a magnet. And at some point before it died, so before it reached that quantum uh, transition where there's maximal chaos, this superconducting phase appeared. So what started out not as a superconductor is quite a commonplace magnet, uh, not even conducting electricity very well. By changing the conditions, all we did was change the conditions and discovered a new phase emerge. We've entered a new phase, which is now superconductivity. So this is an example of how I use quantum alchemy, or what I term quantum alchemy, to transform a material into a novel quantum phase of matter. And these are techniques I use to discover um, similarly more exotic, more unconventional uh, phases of matter. And the next step is so superconductors are already known. And um, as I mentioned, they used an MRI in CERN. They can be used, for instance, in um, electric motors, in electric aircraft. They can be made very light, and the levitation uh, makes it possible to create a motor without ball bearings, without friction. So they used uh, to make electric aircrafts possible by aircraft, uh, Airbus and Boeing. They can be used in superconducting chips, so the applications are clearly um, profound, and this is just for superconductivity. There's many other exotic quantum phases. And just something that I, I'd like to leave you um, with is this thought that mapping out a space of um, quantum phases, and actually mapping out physical phenomena in general, is not about a finite space of knowledge and somehow we're chipping away at some point, we're going to arrive at a theory of everything and we can explain everything and we'll be done. It's much more like an infinite universe. So each time, it, this, is, this is a Mandelbrot set, this is just a schematic of a fractal. And what this is just capturing is that each time you get to the end of a known phase, another one starts. So I showed you the example of a magnet ending with a superconductor, but it's infinite. It's an open system that has no end. So each time you make a discovery, you enter a portal into a new phase, that's the beginning of a new infinity. So you have infinitely branching infinities. Um, and there's a really nice quote from Lucretius from BC, actually. So uh, this is an you know, ancient um, quotation. And so he's talking about there's no lack of borders, but rather an infinite proliferation of them. Everything is bounded by something else without any absolute limitation from outside. Nature is not a boundless unity, but an infinitely limited multiplicity of limits without a fixed absolute limit. In other words, everything in nature moves, even its limits. And that's really the thought that um, I'd like to leave you with, and that drives how we experiment, that we're not reaching some finite end, but it's an infinite voyage of discovery. Um, and this is just um, a s sort of, yeah, image to leave you with. What appears like turbulence, when this is taking off, you can see the patterns emerging and the organizing emerging where what looks like chaos and turbulence is actually a new formation. Thank you. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.